Um, sorry, Russ, your mic is on mute. Perfect. Thanks, Brendan. Uh, so good morning, good afternoon uh, to all of you. A very warm welcome on behalf of the uh, IEPB events team to today's webinar, 2030 Insight for Our Children. I would like to open with some brief housekeeping notes before I hand over to Jissa James uh, to formally welcome you to today's session. Uh, first of all, we are delighted to offer closed captioning in English for today's session. To access these captions, please click on the caption CC icon in the bottom right of your video feed. A caption box will then appear below the video. Please note that these captions are auto generated and there may be a few seconds delay. Please be aware as well that this webinar is being recorded and it will be available to watch and share via the replay tab on the Hopin platform and on the IPB website post event. We would like to encourage you to use social media channels to promote and engage a wide audience with this event. So please use the following hashtag, hash, hashtag, hashtag focus on child eye health. We would also like to encourage our virtual attendees to post comments and engage using the Q&A feature within Hopin. Please add the panelist name you would like to address your question to, and we will aim to answer as many questions as possible. We'll also be running a few Slido polls during this webinar. So to participate in the Slido polls, please click on the Slido button found next to the Q&A button and answer the polls when prompted to. And finally, if you've got any technical difficulties, please contact us via the Hopin chat facility or you can email the events team at events at IPB.org. I'm now delighted to hand over to Jissa to welcome you to today's webinar. Thank you very much. Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today. We have 90 minutes together and let's make the most of it. This is an exciting week for child eye health. The leaders of Commonwealth nations made a landmark commitment, especially on child eye health, at the just concluded Heads of Government meeting in Rwanda, and to quote from the communique, uh, taking note of the progress made in increasing access to quality eye care, um, a multi-pronged approach for access to screenings and affordable vision treatments, especially for children. They encourage this and cheers to all my colleagues and others who worked really hard to elevate child eye health in this space. So what is planned for today? This webinar today will discuss actions that we need to take now to accelerate efforts to elevate, integrate, and activate child eye health to meet the growing eye care needs among our children. We will hear three examples that have been successful in creating an impact. And then uh, as a panel, we will discuss child eye health um, and the changing and increasing needs of today and actions that we need to take now for the coming decade. I would like to acknowledge and say a big thank you to Cooper Vision for sponsoring the program and being a part of our Focus on initiatives. Before I introduce our speakers, can I please ask all of you to introduce yourself in the chat? It will be so lovely to know who is in the room and pick up a conversation now or you know, a bit later on the platform. We had great engagement and a wonderful discussion in our first webinar earlier today. And I'm excited to see what, you've, you, what you all have got to ask and share. Um, on that note, I'm so glad that joining us are experts from the field who have made significant contributions in the field of child eye health and help us understand the need, the importance, the challenges, and the way forward to make our children see better and have accessible, affordable, and quality eye care when and wherever they need it. So who are our speakers for today? We have Priya Mujaria. Uh, Milka Mafferi and Andrea Muller, who will talk to you through the examples, and Riswana and Professor Catherine Saunders joining us in the panel. Priya is Head of Global Program Design at Peak Vision and is also the co-chair of IPB School Eye Health Workgroup. She's Assistant Professor at the International Center for Eye Health and has worked on eye health research in multiple countries, 
specifically around Africa and Asia, and with a focus on school and eye health services. Joining us is Milka, and she's Associate Professor at Mohimbili University of Health and Allied Health Sciences, and she's engaged with training, research, and consultancy. And she also coordinated the Mohimbili Childhood, Childhood Pre Blindness Prevention Initiative for almost eight years. Um, a focus of her research is on integration of IK for children into the primary health system uh, in Tanzania, which we will hear more about. Uh, we have Andreas Moller. Andreas is a consultant to the World Health Organization's Eye Care Program, leading the development of the recently released Guide to Action. He has worked across various sectors of the public health field, supporting eye research and prevention of blindness initiatives in academia, the non-government sector, and also within the UN system. Like I said, joining us later in the panel is um, Dr. Jamil Riswana and Professor Catherine Saunders. Um, Riswana currently heads the Rivoli Vision Academy at the Rivoli Vision UAE. Um, she has been a faculty member and mentor for the Looking Towards the Future Optometry Program in Advocacy and Leadership run by WCO and is also a member of the WCO's um, Education Committee. She has been involved in a number of school eye health initiatives for over a decade now. Professor Catherine is a senior academic at Ulster University with a special interest in children's eye care. She has published over 90 peer-reviewed scientific papers whose topics center on the development of visual function. And she's very passionate about evidence-based eye care and the quality of access to eye care services. There is a lot more to add to each of their credibility and experience, and you can read more about what they do um, and how they interact in this space or in our web page. So thank you everyone for uh, all your efforts and time into this webinar. Um, before we crack on with the presentations and discussions of the day, um, we would like to start off with two questions. Um, let's go to poll number one. And what I have for you here is, without using your job title, can you describe what you do? Please do clean um, your role and what you do. You can click on the Slido tab next to the chat and the Q&A uh, box. There might be a slight delay in um, for me to see your responses. Um, so I'll wait for a few seconds more. Build partnerships, of course. How can we not stress about it? Engaging with stakeholders towards school eye health advocacy. You're an eye care professional. Providing eye care services. I can see some comments as well. My health coordinator.
it's interesting to note that we we have a, a, a group of people who work from different angles in child eye health um i in the interest of time i might just have to move on to the next poll i can see that uh, advocacy and program management also belongs to the profiles of people who are in here um the next question for today uh, up for poll are is what are issues in child eye health that need urgent attention and intervention in the setting new work if you all could please get into the slido tab on the platform that would be really helpful mission guardian this is a word cloud so um i would like to see a few more responses coming in universal or integrated screening this came up in the first webinar as well lack of integration reduced awareness this interesting to note that you know could the comprehensiveness of our programs are taking a real importance in the discussions high impact evidence pediatric vision assessment private sector endorsement yes the lack of integration very interesting observations rob screening and nurses training if i'm getting that right lack of trained professionals engagement of parents thank you for your responses um we had very similar observations in the first webinar as well so um we'll come back to slido and with more engagement opportunities but uh, let's let's move on um so to frame our discussion let me present some numbers we spoke some of you pointed out to the high impact evidence as of 2021 globally close to uh, 26% of the world's population were under 15 years old over 90 million children and adolescents live with vision loss around 4 out of 10 children that are blind have eye conditions that could have been prevented or could be managed if the child had access to eye care services It is also estimated that half the world's population will have myopia by 2050, and there is increasing am am amount of evidence is coming through wherein we say that during the pandemic we have seen a rise in the progression of myopia. 2030 Insight, our new sector strategy, recognizes that we will have to work differently to make sure eye health is recognized. and prioritized in the broader health economic social and development agenda we'll need to embed eye health as a fundamental development issue integrate within our sector and wider healthcare and activate consumer demand and market change how do we plan advocate and action this for child eye health um I'm moving on to the recorded presentations and examples that I spoke about a while back and we have to present on the elevate theme um I have the presentation from Priya 
Good vision and eye health help unlock better educational outcomes, yet eye health is often not addressed in school health and educational policies, plans, and practice. The Sustainable Development Goal 4, Quality Education, cannot be achieved if child eye health is not included. It needs political prioritization and resolutions, development plans, national policies, and budgets relating to achieving quality education. And the SVG doesn't stop here and neither the connection. School eye health policies, plans, and practice have shown to be cost-effective in multiple settings. On that note, let's hear from Priya on elevating and advocating for child eye health and why this is so important. Thank you to IAPB for the opportunity today to talk about child eye health and its importance from the perspective of the Elevate theme in the sector strategy. From a child eye health perspective, the Elevate theme focuses on embedding child eye health into development plans, national strategies, policies and budgets. You may have heard me speak about school eye health programmes and frequently refer to the statistics on the number of children that have a vision impairment. Globally, school eye health programmes are common and implemented in many different ways, and they also have the potential to change the lives of millions of children. Over 90 million children worldwide have an eyesight problem, ranging from mild vision impairment to blindness, and the problem is only getting worse. And if we just think about the sheer number of children, over 25% of the global population consists of children, and 40% of the population of Africa is under 14. Therefore, school eye health programmes are important and they're much needed to help identify children with eye health conditions in a timely manner. However, these programmes must be comprehensive, sustainable and focus on the eye health needs of children. We often advocate for school eye health and we talk about the large numbers and it's quite easy to get lost in them. So I want to share my experience of meeting Mariam. I met Mariam when she was 13 years old and I remember her very clearly because she could barely see a few metres ahead of her and as expected she was severely myopic. I'm never going to forget the expression that she had as she looked through the trial frames, the smile and the mixture of pure joy and shock. And she picked some pink frames that she was excited to take home. Part of the work I was doing was addressing the stigma that surrounds glasses wear, especially for girls. And so I remember returning to Mariam's school about three months later where we were investigating compliance. And I was really looking forward to seeing her and finding out whether she was happy and wearing her pink glasses. At the end of the day, we looked at the list of children that were absent and I recognised Mariam's name. So I asked the teacher about her. She ran back to the classroom and returned with a dusty glasses case labelled Mariam. She handed me the case and said that Mariam wasn't at school. So I explained that, fine, we know we're not here to take back the glasses. But she shook her head and said, no, Mariam is no longer at school. Mariam hadn't been at school for the past two, three months. In fact, she had probably just used her new pink glasses for a week or two before she was removed from school as it was time to get married. The Lancet Commission on Global Eye Health included an in-depth look at the relationship between eye health and the SDGs. And there's enough compelling evidence to prove that improving access to eye health services for children will contribute to achieving many of the sustainable development goals, including SDG 4. There is evidence that providing children with glasses improved their academic test scores. Results from a randomized control trial in China show that providing vision correction reduced the odds of failing a class by 44%. In other studies, glasses were improved reading and word identification and attendance at school. But it's not just about this direct link between education and child eye health that's important. Child eye health impacts the other SDGs too. SDG 3, good health and well-being are also affected. When a child has poor vision, their ability to socialise, interact with their peers and their general confidence is also impacted. Gender equality is also important to address when it comes to planning child eye health services. When girls are not at school or are forced into early marriage, they are already disadvantaged. Like Mariam, they will not be able to achieve their maximum potential. While there has been progress over the last decades, 
More girls are going to school. Fewer girls are forced into early marriage. There are still girls like Mariam who, despite all our efforts, are not accessing the services they need. And the challenges remain. We all agree that school eye health programs are important, but how do we improve these? How do we address the challenges that we're now faced with? While I don't have the answer, but any solution to a problem this big in terms of numbers and complexity requires a solution that's innovative, relevant, and most importantly, appropriate. School eye health programs need to collaborate and engage with the health and education sector. And while this is already happening in some programs and regions, where school eye health are a part of nutrition or vaccination programs, this isn't happening consistently. Collaboration and inclusion of government, health, education, and even finance sectors, non-governmental organizations, civil society, researchers, innovators, and private sector is the key for the future of school eye health. There has been a number of collaborative efforts that have made great strides in this, such as the previous Our Children's Vision campaign, the Orbis Reach program, Eye Alliance, etc. But the challenge now is how do we engage as a sector in unison to make sure that all our efforts together are having an impact? Sometimes when, we're not, when we are in our own settings and doing our roles, all these discussions and ideas seem very abstract and you don't know where to start or what to contribute. So I'm going to share a quick example of an opportunity that was created a few weeks ago when IAPB hosted an event ahead of the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting that happened in Rwanda last week. A few of us started talking to each other about the status of school eye health screening in the UK, something that's not standardised or in fact available throughout the UK. And it just so happened that one of the persons in this conversation was a crossbench peer at the House of Lords. This conversation progressed outside of the event and last week an amendment was tabled at the House of Commons by her. Now, while this doesn't mean a, ch mean a change will happen tomorrow, it does mean that we've been able to raise a question about annual screening for school children in the UK. And this has taken a very long time. But this only happened because we took advantage of an, of an opportunity that presented and had a very clear ask. This slide speaks for itself. There is an interest in school nutrition, in eye health, in vision, in the well-being and welfare of children by sports personalities, celebrities, corporates. And I think we need to be more open and engage with different sectors. In the interest of time, I'm not going to go into the details of each campaign, but on this slide are Marcus Rashford, an English footballer, Virat Kohli, an ex-Indian cricket captain, Amitabh Bachchan, a very famous Bollywood actor, and Disney's new heroine, Encanto. While I'm not suggesting that we start spending our budgets on celebrity campaigns, what we do need to do is become more innovative with the opportunities that do become available to us. And I'd also like to encourage everyone to participate in advocacy campaigns that are led by IAPB. They continue to do incredible work to drive eye health up the global agenda, but it is an uphill battle. So I never saw Mariam again, but years on I still do think of her and I have her pink glasses to remind me of why we still have a long way to go to ensure that school eye health programmes are of a good quality and that they're no longer standalone and one-off initiatives. They have to be sustainable programmes that are embedded within school health and education and social services, and they have to be programmes that are comprehensive. Thank you. Thank you, Priya. I can't agree more with your thoughts on us being innovative and grabbing every opportunity that comes our way. And of course, about collaborating well beyond our sector and to speak for our children. Thanks once again. Let's move to the next presentation for today. As a sector, we will need to come together to work differently. Integrated people-centered eye care looks at reorient reorienting the model of care, coordinating services within and across sectors, and creating an enabling environment. We need a holistic, integrated approach where eye care is treated as an essential element within the wider healthcare services and is universally available to everyone. We also need to ensure there is integration within and between the different eye care professions. 
Let's hear from Milka about her work in Tanzania on integrating child eye health in the primary health setting. So thank you very much. Uh, so today we are talking about the integration of primary eye care for children into the general child health system. Uh, the, why do we integrate? Why is it important? We know that many diseases, for example, measles that cause child mortality and morbidity are also the causes of visual impairment and blindness, but they are also preventable at the community or the primary level. So it is important to integrate in order to share resources, including human resources. For example, one nurse may be performing general eye care at the same time performing uh, eye care. Also share the infrastructure for the promotion talks and materials, but also we can share funds in order to, to reduce the implementation costs. And lastly, to provide comprehensive health promotion messages that are important for eye care because eye care is part of the general health talks. Now, what do we mean by integration? We mean that eye care for children is being implemented within the general child health system in order to ensure that every child who present to the child health services is screened for eye problems. Now, we need to include in the routine general care of the child, we need to include uh, newborn eye screening and also that all children who cannot see or those who have a white pupil or those who have serious eye injury need to be referred to the eye worker as immediately as possible. But other, other things is also to practice cleaning eyes at birth and application of antibiotic, not to use traditional eye medication, but also to include, to include eye health education messages in the health talks that are given at the clinic. Now, how can we integrate? We can integrate by training primary healthcare workers in child eye health so that they are able to screen and refer appropriately. We can also integrate by increasing awareness in the whole child health team about child eye conditions. For example, obstetricians, pediatricians, physiotherapists, midw midwives, and others. We can also integrate by working the community with teachers, community health workers, parents, caretakers, and even drug distributors. We can also integrate by sharing data uh, for monitoring. Now, how did we manage to integrate child eye care in Tanzania? Now, firstly, we had an evaluation of a pilot study where we trained uh, primary health workers health workers in the 10 key World health organization activities for health eyes. And we found that there was inadequate knowledge and skills among primary health workers. But that improvement, there was also improvement after the training, improvement in the knowledge and skills after the training, which was retained to, to about one year. We then conducted a formative research in rural Tanzania and created a theory of change. In that study, we also uh, found baseline situation analysis of mothers and caretakers knowledge of eye conditions and behavior towards uh, anybody who is sick with eye conditions. We also reviewed the, clinic, the clinics in terms of the number of children seen, uh, the, the available consumables and equipment. And also we looked at the primary health workers knowledge and practices regarding child eye health. Now, further, we, inter we, we continued other steps by asking ourselves, how can we integrate child health into the general health system? Which fora can we use? And then we thought about the IMNCI. The Integrated Management of Childhood Illnesses is a program which is implemented uh, globally in more than 100 countries. And the aim is to reduce uh, mortality rate among under fives. 
And so it is a program which is well implemented in Tanzania by primary health workers, mainly at primary health facilities. So in Tanzania, uh, training of primary health workers is done as in-service training. And so we thought this was a better forum where we can enter to include child eye health. Now, we conducted a stakeholders meeting where after explaining our intent and what we wish to do, a consensus was reached by the ministry health agreeing to develop a program which could be included in the training of IMCI. So we developed the eye health module, which is called module six. Pilot tested it in real life, IMCI training. That is, we, we, use, we had to train IMCI the usual way, but including the eye health module. And from there on, the eye health module is included in the training of the national IMCI and it continues to be trained to date. So what impact has it brought? Uh, until now, the, on every training of IMCI in the country, the eye care is also included, and we feel this is sustainable as it will continue being trained all the time. Until now, 3,000 primary health workers have been trained from 2018 onwards. And our plan for the next phase is to have um, evaluation of the national program where uh, IMCI is being trained, including the health module. And this will be in collaboration with the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. We hope that uh, apart from evaluation, scaling up of the program is possible. Uh, we are very thankful to the we are very thankful to the people who worked with us, including London School of Hygiene, Muhas, the Minister of Health, and all these people that were very instrumental, not forgetting Professor Claire Gilbert, who worked tireless in this project. Thank you so much for the same. Thanks, Melka. That's an incredible example. And I'm so delighted to know about the progress this intervention is making and speaking about a sustainable and scalable model. Looking forward to listening to you more. Moving on, we will now have a presentation around Activate from Andreas. Empowering people to demand eye care services by making them more aware of what they can do to look after their own eyes is essential to ensuring access to quality eye care services. This should start from childhood, where individuals have all the information they need to protect their own eyes, and crucially, take the steps needed to look after their vision, from taking regular breaks from close work through to seeking help for any ailments or discomfort. This level of awareness and demand should flow through every single person's education pathway and employment environments. Andreas will now present on uh, the World Health Organization's Myopia Air Program and the impact envisaged to influence individual action. My name is Dr. Andreas Müller. I work with the WHO Vision and Eye Care Program at headquarters. And I would like to thank uh, IEPB for inviting me to this important webinar uh, on uh, focus on child eye health. Um, I was asked to present on a new WHO tool named the Myopia Ed. And I will start off with some background information. Most of you will be familiar with though. So as you're all aware, Myopia represents an important public health challenge globally with well over 2 billion people being impacted. Importantly, and although the correction of spectacles is highly cost-effective, uncorrected myopia is a leading cause of vision impairment in children and adults. We do know this problem is escalating and uh, the numbers are expected to be well over 3 billion people by the year 2030. In recognition of this challenge, uh, and for the first time, WHO member states recently endorsed an ambitious new global target 
for refractive error at the 74th World Health Assembly in 2021, namely a 40% increase in effective coverage of refractive error by the year 2030. This is a very ambitious target and WHO recognizes that a comprehensive approach is required in order to achieve this target. With this in mind, WHO and the International Telecommunications Union, or ITU, have developed the Myopia Ed Toolkit, uh, recognizing that improving public education is critical and the management of refractive error and to drive the demand for spectacles, particularly in lower income settings. The toolkit, the Myopia Ed Toolkit in itself has two key components. First is the evidence-based message library to be delivered to individuals in the population. Second is a handbook or toolkit which contains background information, but more importantly contains guidance and resources required to support any country or stakeholders in a step-by-step -step fashion um, through the planning, the developing, the implementation, but also monitoring of a digital health message initiative uh, targeting myopia education. So now let's look at some of the aims and objectives of the Myopia Ed program. The first objective is really to support behavior change that contributes to delaying the onset and also possibly slowing the progression of myopia. This is particularly important considering that we see complications from high myopia are now an emerging cause of irreversible blindness in some regions of the world. The second objective is to improve awareness and health literacy of the importance of regular eye examinations and to comply with spectacle wear amongst people with myopia. This is important because we know that even when children or adolescents do have access to spectacles, quite often they don't wear these specs when they should due to a range of misconceptions, but also stigma at times. Who is the target population for myopia? The program targets four distinct segments of the population and separate message libraries have been developed for each of them. First, the general population involved in the care of children. Second, parents or caregivers of children with myopia. Third, the adolescents with myopia and also adults with myopia. What are the key themes of the program? The general themes of the messages in the Myopia Ed program cover education such what are the causes, what are the warning signs, and addressing some of those misconceptions that we heard before. Then, themes targeting those lifestyle behavior changes that we implicated, in particular delaying the onset of myopia. This includes, in particular, promoting increased time spent outdoors amongst children and also reduced intensive near work activity, such as the use of devices, particularly during leisure times. Thirdly, the a key theme is the importance of regular comprehensive eye examinations in children. This is very important, especially considering children's eyes and prescriptions are constantly changing. Last, the program promotes compliance, meaning the fact that spectacles are safe and they should be worn regularly. Now, how is the program uh, and its messages designed to be communicated? Firstly, the program design is a recommendation and any country or, other, or any implementer of Myopia Ed can adapt this in line with the resources they have available and, and also the local contacts. At the moment, the structured messages have been designed mainly for one-way SMS delivery. This can be used in other message, uh, messaging modalities, for instance, WhatsApp or WeChat and also social media. The message libraries also contain some multimedia suggestions that can accompany the messages where this is also possible. The duration of the program is such that individuals who sign up for the program would receive messages over a six or 12 months period. Now this period is in line with evidence that, is, uh, uh, that this is the amount of time that is typically needed 
for a uh, behavioral change to be incorporated in a person's life. In the acute phase of the program, the individuals will receive uh, messages at a higher frequency and this decreases over time, so not to overburden the user. The messages are categorized into one of four domains, motivation, support, information or reminders. Here I provided a few selected example messages in each of these domains to give, uh, to give you a taste of, of the actual messages. So for instance, uh, did you know if a parent has myopia, their children are more likely to develop it too? Regular eye tests will be important to detect myopia early. Or research shows spending more time outdoors lowers the risk of myopia, encourage your child to go outside and play. Or worried about your child developing myopia? Remember, eye health professionals are here to help and support you. Or remember to wear your glasses every day at school. This will help you see things clearly in your classroom. Who are the intended key end users of the Myopia Ed Toolkit? The Myopia Ed Toolkit targets government officials, academics uh, and other in-country implementing partners who are involved in deploying large-scale digital health intervention programs. However, the Myopia Ed Toolkit and messages are available for anyone or for any individual or group to use in their efforts to promote, uh, to improve or promote population education on myopia generally. Lastly, I want to touch on what the eye care sector can do to support myopia aid. First, I see that there's the opportunity for technical support. Uh, partners might provide translations, might carry out uh, adaptations or revisions of the messages based on cultural realities in their countries, or they might carry out evaluations on the impact of the program in a country. Where necessary, partners might provide funding where countries lack the required resources for a myopia prevention campaign or, uh, and, and very importantly, partners might uh, raise awareness about myopia as a public health problem and about the existence of the myopia toolkit to be implemented. With this, I'd like to end my presentation and I wish you all a successful webinar. Thank you, Andreas. Uh, great to see iHealth specifically part of the Digital Health Initiative, Be Healthy, Be Mobile by WHO. And I know that uh, there are other modules in this program about conditions relevant to iHealth as well. So please um, feel free to check these amazing resources out. Um, and it is also equally interesting that, uh, you know, it's designed to use evidence to affect behavior change. And some, some of you highlighted the need to address um, the compliance, the stigma, et cetera, as a, as a challenge uh, around child eye health. So these initiatives are a great help to address all those aspects too. Uh, with the three presentations down, we are now into our next segment. Um, and before getting into the discussion, can I please remind each one of you, if you have any questions, please do post it on the Q&A session and we will take it up during the discussion. Um, it's time for the next poll and I hope you all can get to know the Slido tab there. And the question here is, what are the changes that you would like to see actioned for child eye health by 2030? What do you think need to happen? When you get to the slide of all, you will have to choose webinar two um, so that your answers come through.
more integration and financing calls. We can devise all the policies and plans, but we definitely need funding and and appropriate financing to execute our plans. Interesting, more technology at the primary level. Give us a few more seconds to see if uh, more responses are coming through. Increase school screening programs, greater recognition of the scale of the issue. Yes. Thank you, everyone, um, for joining in that discussion. I guess secure, sustainable funding for school vision screening programs. Evidence to support and leverage these funds. More training for teachers in basic eye health for children. There were a couple of questions um, around integration and how the task and responsibilities are taken up by the primary health workers, etc. We can we can have a much more detailed discussion in the panel. Thank you, everyone. Um, in the interest of time, I'll have to move on from this question. Um, can I please have um, Reswana, Milka, and Catherine with me for the panel discussion? All right. Thank you uh, again for joining me today in this discussion. Um, Without wasting any time, I would like to start with an opening question. We know the challenge, the need, the importance, and the urgency with which we should address child eye health. What do you think should we be doing differently? And if I may start off with uh, Milka, if that's all right. Yeah. Now, thank you so much, Jisa. It's so much important to take action now. And the main issue in terms of integration is to ensure that uh, all the sectors that deal with child health should also deal with child eye health. That's what we mean by integration. So if you have any, any program which is being conducted to children, they or we need to increase child eye health. For example, if if you have uh, if you have obstetricians, they have to know they are dealing with neonates, and therefore they need to know what to do in terms of neonates. In what can be done in terms of newborn screening? Uh, when you go to the to the RCH or reproductive child health workers where the, the infants up to five years are screened for other problems, like if they have pneumonia, if they, if they are being monitored for growth, uh, growth monitoring, then those primary health workers have also to screen these children for eye conditions. Because most of the eye conditions, uh, children cannot complain. And sometimes the mothers also do not know. So, 
such a forum where re reproductive child health workers are monitoring children growth they should also monitor if children have got any eye conditions by looking into their eyes and saying whether there is there is anything abnormal but in order for these primary health workers to do anything we needed to train them we needed to train them and encourage them to understand child health apart from the general health they are giving to the kids, they also need to include child health. That is one of the actions that we need to do to have as many uh, trained primary health workers to be able to, to screen and refer appropriately. Thank you, Wilka. Very interesting observation. And you, you sort of rightly brought in the, the question about starting the care right from birth and what we do about it. Um, can I ask uh, Raswana if you could just add on, do you have anything to add on to that observation? I mean, yeah. all the all the, all the speakers so far, I think, um, sort of uh, convey the importance of integration. So integration, of course, is the key. And I think, uh, uh, I think that's the message. And more, I mean, improved engagement among all concerned stakeholders, be it with respect to policy development or advocacy, um, when it comes to, you know, uh, our school eye health programs, we need to have both service delivery based models, which are primarily like, you know, that's more in number, but also research centric models, because uh, uh, high impact quality evidence is the key now. So we really need more data on some of these aspects that even Dr. Milka was mentioning. Yes, we know that um, in the school age group of like, say, seven to 17, we have data. But what about the preschool? What about the toddlers? What sort of um, eye health problems are prevalent? And there is a lot of trust on myopia. So what about hyperopia? Because good near vision is really imperative to uh, improve literacy and academic performance and all that. Um, so definitely, I think we need more uh, high quality data across all the age range of children to understand the impact of vision on the global development of the child as a whole, and then be able to integrate this um, uh, into the general uh, health system. I think that's something uh, 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 that's really important from my point from uh, my point of view. Yeah, can't agree more. Collaboration comes up again. Um, Catherine, uh, what would you like to add to that? Just simply um, that I really agree with Rizwana about the hyperopes and about the non-myopic children. You know, that's it's so difficult to identify those children without really high quality screening in, in place. Um, but also I really wanted to, to say that the Milka's um, presentation about the Tanzanian project, it'll be so useful to have that evaluation report in a few years time that really can identify how effective the intervention and the training and it, embedding that service in primary care um, will be for the for the funding in, in future because as, as, as everyone has said we need to have a really strong evidence base to be able to take to the funders to be able to advocate with because it's all very good to have little pockets of care that people think are working really well but until we have that evidence then the hard cash won't follow. And having some training um, that's sustainable and continues on and somewhere for people to go to get their eye care once they've been identified. So there's, it is a huge um, network of people and changes that need to be made. But I think that evidence is such an important aspect. And, and there's lots of focus on myopia at the moment, which is great. I do a lot of um, research around the area of myopia. It's not that we shouldn't... Um, be concentrating on that but we mustn't forget the children with other eye health problems and other refractive issues um who are you know there and it's really affecting their education and their general um ability to to make money in the future and and yeah i just think the more we can empower our schools and any primary eye health primary health uh, contact with parents to to include eye health in those contexts then that would be fantastic Thank you, Catherine. Um, a very interesting, in fact, and that sort of brings me to my next question, which uh, which speaks about evidence. Um, we have made um, huge progress with the World Health Organization's report on vision and the Lancet Global Health Commission on Global Eye Health report. 
Um, and we must continue to develop the research and evidence base to both support our case, um, support and advocate for child eye health. Um, could you please throw some light into where are we lacking and what evidence can we as a sector need to bring to the table to elevate our case further? Perhaps, um, Catherine, if I may start with you. Sure. Uh, the, the challenge around um, some aspects of, of the epidemiology that we need to understand lie in the challenges to, to make those measurements. So the, one of the um, areas that Rizwana brought up was these hypropic children who go undetected um, or anisometropic children who go undetected because their eyes look normal, they're functioning well, they might underperform at school, but um, that people don't realize that that's because they're not seeing well, or they could go on into adulthood with visual impairment in one eye due to anisometropia that's not been corrected. And the challenge there is, is that it's not easy to identify those children through just a, a basic vision screening that measures acuity, distance acuity. So we need to be cleverer about the, the, about the research and really understand the underlying epidemiology in different populations. So if we're going to Tanzania, the underlying population might have very different refractive needs at age four than if we go to somewhere in East Asia where there'll be much more myopia in four-year-olds than there would be in, in Tanzania, potentially. But there's there's quite a lot of areas of the world where we don't have good epidemiological information for, and, and that's what we really need so that we can target our screening so that it's most effective, we're using our money most effectively. Thanks, Catherine. One size doesn't fit all, isn't it? I mean, and, and we definitely need to prove the needs of every, every part of the world to advocate better. Um, would you like to add anything more to that, Raswana? I mean, uh, as Catherine rightly pointed out, uh, when it comes to evidence, it needs to be both uh, country specific and community specific. Of course, there are these seminal uh, papers that we've got. But when it comes to be able to advocate, we also need longitudinal studies beyond cross-sectional yeah. or snapshot data to assess the efficacy and impact of the interventions. Like for for. For now, we have adequate data that says that, yes, spectacle correction improves academic performance. Uh, but what happens over over like a period of time? Because there are aspects of compliance. There are aspects of because we just can't do one time screening and say, OK, we've done everything uh, well and good for the child. So what hap what happens to their quality of life and what happens to the uh, the academic performance in the long run? So definitely we've just barely scratched the surface when it comes to evidence, when it comes to community and country specific data and recent papers a couple of papers in the ophthalmic epidemiology pointed out to the lacunae especially in the post covid world as how we coped up with the vision screening requirements because the whole the the vision screening models have sort of collapsed and now we need to look at how do we reach out to these people and especially when it comes to children who have reduced accessibility or no accessibility in the high poverty community and stuff like that, how are we going to reach out to these people? So I think definitely a lot of scope is there when it comes to innovation and in, when it comes to improving the accessibility. And also when it comes to assessing the longitudinal impact, I think because the next set of data and evidence would definitely require more longitudinal studies. Um, and of course, I'm not I'm not going to dig deep into strabismus, amblyopia and all that stuff because uh, I think there is so much of work that needs to be really done when it comes to the kids at a much younger age. Yeah. Thank you, Raswan. It sort of, sort of reminded me back to the story Priya shared about um, her uh, school eye health uh, work and Mariam. Um, so, Melka, can I ask if you would like to add? Yeah, I also, in terms of uh, providing uh, evidence, is very important. For example, in this program that uh, primary health workers are being trained, there are a number of challenges that we, when we did the formative research, we, we, we thought about it. For example, provision of uh, uh, equipment and consumables to enable the primary health workers to work, but also uh, will they be able to continue working because screening for children's conditions is an addition work. So will they comply to do the to examine children's the, the eyes of, of, of children, but also or will they feel this is too much and they may not do it. 
So evidence is very important because it will not stop at training. Training is one aspect, but ensuring that the primary health worker is doing what they have been trained for is another thing. So that's why we say we have to, at some point, do an evaluation to see how this one is working. And yeah. the, my, my take is that uh, this should not be the only forum where primary health workers need to get the knowledge about eye conditions. We need to think of other forum where these, these primary health workers can also learn. But we are encouraged by the issue that before, before this training, there was nothing that could be taught to primary health workers. So they, they did not know if they see, for example, a child who has a, a retinoblastoma that is a cancer of the eye, they would not recognize. So they might even delay to refer this child and when this child is fired, it is too late. So just by, by, being, by being taught, if they hear about this, they, they, may, they may not examine the, the, the children of, of, of the, the children's eyes, but knowing this is a step, is a step of, of incorporating eye care into the primary system. Uh, so I think apart from evidence, we are still we are still encouraged that uh, something is going to the primary level, which is very important because this is the first point where children and adults start to see a health a health worker. Thank you, Melka. Um, talking about evidence and the impact it can create, not only in, among the policymakers but also in the service delivery and continuum of care is. Is, is really, really important and cannot mention more about uh, the significance of addressing it much more and beyond myopia. Um, so moving on, um, uh, can I please urge uh, our audience to please pop in the questions if they have any um, into the Q&A box. So Riswana, probably I'll, I'll direct my next question to you. Um, so you spoke about school eye health programs um, and um, how important it is to elevate um, and have a comprehensive system around it. Whom should we be influencing and including more into this conversation so that um, it gets the attention it deserves at a national level in policies, budgets, systems, etc.? Would you like to throw some light on it? Yeah, I mean, thanks, Jessa. So definitely, uh, uh, as all of us agreed upon, getting some high quality evidence is the key and then also improved engagement among all concerned stakeholders. So based on my experience with school eye health programs and also with all the, the recent evidence that's coming up, uh, I think, um, first of all, uh, we need to be incorporating uh, training and uh, uh, to all IK professionals and teachers, for example, teachers as part of their training curriculum uh, needs to be uh, provided this awareness about uh, vision and eye health problems. I think it's happening in certain communities, but has not penetrated definitely uh, across all the sectors. So definitely, I mean, that's that's the role and where we can bring in a lot of technology and objectivity to the assessment, like how Priya's uh, peak and related models have have been able to screen and that will give us a lot of data first of all to to even you know advocate saying that you know this is the magnitude this is the burden of the problem so to me first i think it's about engagement among all concerned stakeholders with a lot of upskilling and training where ngos can come forward and even in the optometry school beginning from the first year the students be involved in all of these vision care activities Next, when it comes to who should we hold accountable, of course, uh, the speakers did point out to the fact that government is the key. I mean, holding the government accountable, Ministry of Health, School Eye Health Education, 
because that's the that's the most powerful uh, way to be able to bring in a standard approach to integrating eye care um, into the general health into the um, into the assessment of the global well being of the child as well as um, uh, you know evaluating eye health but again data on eye health as a key measure as a key biomarker in influencing the global well being of the child now let's take uh, let's take the current some of the models that we have where um, you know ik being implemented as part of the nutritional uh, programs or uh, dietary dietary care programs and stuff like that but but then there's a lot of connectivity between eye care general health well being outdoor activities for overall bone density with both, i mean improvements in bone density uh, improved sleep deep overall mood and uh, emotional well being of the child so i think as part of the entry into a school admission itself i think eye health should be uh, uh, sort of one of the the key assessment factor and uh, um, and that also improves accessibility to eye care uh, for for the child as such um so holding the government accountable but also using evidence and upskilling as a means to um assure them saying that yes we've got the workforce we've got the evidence and then it's doable uh, and of course then comes funding and collaboration and networking but that's that would be my uh, my sense you've covered it all um, can i ask uh, milka uh, do you have anything more to add to her yeah i think just to say we really need to have an enabling environment to ensure yeah, that uh, uh whoever is concerned with child health also does child eye health and uh, the enabling environment can on, only be provided not only by the government but also uh by ev everybody who is dealing with eye health but mainly it is the government with all its institutions for example uh in Tanzania it's the for children is the reproductive and child health which is for under 5s but also to include uh i health screening for school i health screening although it is not there currently but as we see that um even the conditions in children are changing we are starting to see myopia also which was not very common because of the changing of the environment and uh maybe too much close awake in children whatever or this will lead to bigger numbers of children with myopic so school i have is still very important even in uh, in us but that who will be who should be contacted is the government we need to advocate advocate and advocate thank you malka katrin would you like to add anything more just reflecting what on what milka said about the um introduction of myopia in as more of a health concern in her area just with the changing environment that children in that population are being exposed to that these any screening uh, programs that are put in place will need to be regularly reviewed because as populations change with envir as environment changes or needs change and burden changes they will need to be reviewed and this idea of key indicators that rizwana picked up on um i know in the uk there's a or in the part of the uk i live in there's a sort of health screening done at 2 years of age and vision is in there but because it's not one of the key indicators that are reported back when audit is done if that isn't included it it's not noticed that it's been missed that it hasn't been undertaken or it's been um undertaken and not recorded so the sort of quality around um those programs and and the indicators making sure that i indicators the right eye indicators regularly reviewed are in the right place so that there's some accountability um around the training and it actually having an impact on the child thanks katrin definitely um i guess this is this is sort of a pivotal time uh, for everyone in our health and there are so much happening from an advocacy point of view from uh, uh, we have the un resolution of vision we now have the agreement from the commonwealth leaders there is just so much there is a guide for action coming up from um who then um the indicators on refractive error and cataract for the countries to act on so definitely there is 
scope for us to highlight child health as an issue and elevate uh, it among our decision makers and policy makers and and what every one of us to count definitely um can i just remind for questions again so if if you do have anything please do post it up on uh, the q and a um moving on i would like to to ask uh, milka and this came up in the first webinar as well um your example um or and your intervention in tanzania definitely involves the primary health care workers so um uh, of course the training and getting them into the system and getting them to know more about child health is crucial but at the same time the attitude which they bring into the table is also equally important uh, especially when you know uh, child health is not part of their profile let's say um and this could be not just with the health workers um across uh, school teachers are another example and there are several other categories of people whom we want to integrate um uh, child health into but they do not really take it up that way um so do you have any interesting observations to make um or how was there a problem uh, or if there was a problem how did you go around it Yeah, of course. Any time you want to introduce something new, there is usually you'll have the first the first thing was that the primary health workers were very enthusiastic because this was something new. Uh before when they see a child with eye problems, they would just they have no confidence. They would just say, "Oh, this is not my I don't know about this, so maybe take this child somewhere else." but after they have been taught the first feeling was to feel very happy that um, i have learned something new but we know that when they start working they start feeling like uh how do i examine maybe it is uh, it, i do not see many children with eye conditions so maybe it is not easier for me to to understand what is wrong with a child and there something is very clear and so what we did was to teach them we teach them in the module that we have created is very simple very simple for them to be able to identify now this 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 page this uh, child has got maybe a smaller eye than normal maybe this child has a white pupillary reflex maybe this child is not seeing well very simple messages very simple skills for them to be able to identify and refer so that was one thing that uh, acquiring the knowledge was a bit difficult but the other thing was uh, getting the consumables they need a light they need a light which we this is an arc light to be able to do the red reflex and this took time for them to learn but once they learned they said it is okay but the issue is how we, how long can they keep this light because sometimes it is lost in the in the in the facility sometimes they say they don't have money to buy one so you think you you you, you say okay so they can stop examining because they don't have a, a, a light which is actually simple to buy but then they feel they may not have so provision of consumables but the other thing is how 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 do we make sure that they screen how do we make sure that they examine the child because you are not there all the time so getting we need some indicators for example to have an indication in in the in the in the in the card for the child which will show that this eye has been this child has been e examined so to get these indicators into the into, into into the cards of children is not so easy as you need to have a review of these tools and we are working we are working on that but is that is one obstacle that we really need to overcome because if they don't show that they have been examined then we don't know whether they examined them but the other thing is 
they are usually who are called super supervisors who come to the health facilities and collect data. They will collect data on how many children have been given vitamin A or immunization. So when they come, they have to also look carefully to see how many children have been found to have eye problems, how many have been referred, because this will show that these people are working or not. So there are still quite a lot of obstacles that we need to really work on to see how this works properly. Yeah. Thanks, Malga. I think um, you made some very interesting observations, not just about the training part, but also providing them with the necessary resources and an active follow-up afterwards to see how yeah. the program is working. Um, interesting. Um, Raswana, I know you have worked on this field a bit and do, would you have any other observations to make? I mean, I have uh, uh, one of these uh, successful programs that I worked with when it comes to, um, you know, in integration is like with, re with the government of India, uh, we had a program on early identification of cerebral visual impairment. So as part of it, we worked with pediatricians, pediatric neonatologists, pediatric optometrists and ophthalmologists. So one of the important component, I mean, the learning that I've had during this entire, uh, uh, you know, building up this program was um, was definitely bringing in standardized approaches to screening. And as Milka was rightly pointing out, what instruments should we use? What techniques should we bring in? And how should we... Up so, so though everybody have had their formal education, when it comes to really examining newborn babies or like an infant, picking up some of these red flags. So then we, we built and we developed a manual and then we provided training based on the manual. So I think... Uh, some of these structured approaches and bringing in stakeholders and training and upskilling, I think definitely uh, can have a huge impact on uh, on these problems that could otherwise have a great impact on the overall uh, visual development and well-being of the child. Yeah, that's my experience. Thank you, Ruth. Um, Catherine, would you have anything more to add? No, just to really kind of stress that idea about collaboration across different professionals. So it's not just across different professionals from health to education, but even within eye health, not being territorial about ophthalmology, optometry, orthoptics, you know, just thinking about this as eye health and we can all do bits uh, depending on what region you're in, depending on what skills you have, depending on what facilities are available and not, I think sometimes as eye health professionals, we make barriers about our own professions and where we start and stop and where someone else is allowed to carry on. And that can be so detrimental to making progress. So I'm sure none of us in this um, room are, are feeling that way, that we all want to be collaborative and we're just, we've got the children's best interests at heart. But I, I think we need to be aware that those kind of barriers can exist and we need to be sensitive as about how we navigate them for, for really good long-term positive outcomes. Thanks, Catherine. Um, uh, moving on, um, there is this, um, um, we, we heard about the Activate and how the Be Healthy, Be, um, Be Mobile Initiative and the Myopia Air program, all, all focusing on a behavioral change from the parents or the children's side or the individual side to take up care. Now, um, Catherine, I know you work very extensively in that area, and um, there is a lot to be done in terms of creating that demand and creating that action-oriented approach from the individuals. Um, is there anything that you would like to point out to in terms of our approach to generating this demand? Um, is there anything in particular that you would like to suggest? Just really to note that parents differ from each other so not every parent is going to make a behavioral change some would rather wait till their child becomes myopic and then put some drops in their eyes to try and slow the progression of myopia then other parents will absolutely embrace this idea of i can make a behavioral change i can be proactive about my child's eye health um, and obviously it's going to be beneficial to them to be outside more, to play outdoors, to have that time away from the screens. So many, many parents will absolutely embrace that, but not all not all parents will. I think we, we need to be realistic about that from the, from the get-go. Um, but it's exciting. It's exciting to have an area of child health that we can have some preventative impact on. 
um, you know, I think that's that's a real positive um, aspect of myopia management that we shouldn't just think about how to manage it once it happens, but we've got this whole mitigation area to do as professionals um, to educate parents, to educate children that they can take some ownership of their own eye health. And for a myopic parent whose child is more likely to be myopic themselves, I think that's a relatively straightforward message to get across. The challenge is where you have uh, parents that aren't myopic um, and they don't realize that because of the environment that their child has been brought up in, their child has an increased risk yeah. compared to them. Um, and trying to explain how that might be a problem and get, get outside more. I tend to talk to parents about healthy visual diets because they understand about healthy diets. Um, so I see lots of children under the age of five, which in the UK means that not many of them are myopic. But I see a lot of parents come in with these children who are already myopic themselves. And we can talk about healthy visual diets and how they can be proactive around maintaining good eye health through balancing the time they spend doing different things. And because they understand nutrition in a balanced way, I think that does help to make sense to them. Can I just, I know we're coming towards the end of the seminar, but I'd really like to make a plea for children with special educational needs and additional needs too. It's really sort of, I know the focus has to be initially maybe on typically developing children, children who are neurotypical, but there's so much need amongst children who uh, have additional needs and it's very much more difficult for them to, to sort of flag up their challenges um, because if they fail at school, they're expected to fail maybe because of their learning disability, but actually it could be completely being compounded by a visual need that's not met. Um, and there are so many interventions that we can do to make visual outcomes better for children with ed special educational needs, as well as for all our neurotypical kids too. So I'm sorry, I just wanted to throw that in there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think it's integrated people-centered eye care is not just about a, a certain group of people, it's for everyone. Everyone needs care and everyone needs that equal opportunity to access um, care as well. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm sorry, I'll not be able to get to you, uh, Rizwara and Malka, on this question. Um, but I would like to wrap up the panel discussion um, with an elevator pitch. Uh, and this is the time um, when I really, really want to focus on what do you think uh, we need to do now? What is the most important action that you think we should take right now so that no child is needlessly blind or suffers due to poor vision. Um, I'm gonna give one minute to each one of you uh, and I'm gonna start with um, Riswara. I see you smiling. <laughs> no, I was quite, I've, I really felt very happy when Catherine brought out that special children. So my heart is just around, around that, like, of course, it's important to focus on typically developing children, but yes, um, and I can speak about it for hours. But if there's one thing that we need to uh, be focusing right now, I think it's definitely uh, improved engagement among all concerned stakeholders with more awareness, especially because uh, there are a lot of barriers to uh, among parents, especially parents and the people that are part of this whole food chain, you know, in terms of seeking eye care, understanding those barriers and then be able to provide solutions to those barriers which are again very community specific and country specific and even in in recent publications you know it's so surprising to see that parents do not want kids to wear eyeglasses so despite all the efforts that you put into providing um services i think uh, at the back end it's important that we work on changing the mindset and improving awareness about the impact of vision so to me the i think the important piece um, is to uh, is to definitely uh, bring in improved awareness and how you have elevate integrate and activate i think it's important to empower stakeholders incorporate evidence and advocate for change that that's something that i would like to uh, uh, you know, be putting it as my scent for the E, I, and the A. Thank you. That's that's very, uh, yeah, that's that's very thoughtful. Um, Catherine, can I come to you? Sorry, couldn't find my unmute button for a second there. <laughs> Um, I haven't prepared anything for this one minute, but really just listening to everybody about this idea of being integrated. And that means integrating into government and policy and strategy as well. So uh, it might not be an area that we're very comfortable about. And that's why the IAPB is 
important stakeholder because I think you have those um, people that can be advocates, that can lobby, that can look for appropriate avenues across different uh, regions in the world. So that idea of being integrated and embedded I think we just need to look higher than just the professionals, than the parents and the children, although those are all really important areas and the educators of all the eye, eye professions, the teachers and so on. But getting into those government spots, getting to speak to those influential people, making them really understand, telling them stories like Priya's story about the, the child that she saw, you know, having um, real sort of evidence based but uh, case led advocacy so that the, the problem has a name and a face and and we have the solutions ready to, to provide. I think that's what I'd wish for. Thanks, Catherine. Uh, Melissa? Yes, uh, so it's mainly around what my, my, my colleagues have talked about. That is the ensuring that the government has been well advocated because it has all the powers to give, to, to, to tell everybody underground that they need to take care of children, children's health so they can establish programs that will be suitable and sustainable for child eye health. And so once we do that, we, we need to also to ensure about training of those who get in contact first with the children at all levels. Yes. But at the same time, ensuring that the parents, they are the ones who will decide to take the children to hospital or not. Or they may have their own beliefs and uh, thinking what to do when their children, where their children have an eye problem. So all these together, they have to be done together. It, it is not one thing that can help child eye health. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you all so much for joining this discussion today. And on that note, I would like to wrap up today's webinar. Um, a, a big thank you. And I would like to mention specifically uh, Jude, my colleague, and my colleagues at IFPB for uh, you know being supportive and, and helping with uh, shaping up this program. Uh, a special thanks to Cooper Vision for supporting this initiative and um, each one of the panelists and speakers who were there in webinar one um, earlier today and um, and now the three of you who are with us. Um, thank you so much and um, have a great day, everyone. Um, we would like to hear more about what you think about the workshop, um, this webinar, um, and I believe that you will have a a link to Survey Monkey, a feedback questionnaire. If you could please take some time to fill that out, that would be really, really awesome.